All right, so here we are. It is October, October. So you get the message here. We're going to dive into that today and find out if Bitcoin and some of these great crypto assets are actually on the move or are we going to get a, a correction here. We'll break it all down for you guys today. My name is Paul Barron. Welcome back in to Tech Path. All right, let's jump into it. Before we get started, let's go over to iTrust Capital. If you guys are looking at doing some long-term holding on your crypto assets, one of the ways you can do it is through a crypto IRA. So check it out right here, itrustcapital.com. It's the number one crypto IRA platform in America right now. Seven billion in transactions, 200,000 accounts created. Uh, definitely they are killing it over there. Use our link down below. It's going to give you a $100 funding reward. And of course, we get a little help uh, from iTrust to help you guys continue to see this content for free. So. That's one of the ways you can help us out. All right, let's get into a couple of the notes today uh, and really kind of talk uh, where and what has been happening over the weekend. Obviously, Bitcoin's been up. Most of the top 20 have been up. And for the most part, we've even some even seen some of the Web3 projects also get some good positive action. So what's causing that? Obviously, the biggest issue was the, I guess, you know, the scenario that played out right now over the weekend where we actually came to an agreement somewhat of an agreement to not shut the government down, which is always, help, always helpful. Kobe EC comes in and says, breaking Senate vote approved the short-term funding bill to keep the U.S. government open until November 17th. Not bad, 45 days away. This bill includes $16 billion in disaster funding and keeps the U.S. government open for 45 more days. U.S. government is seeing a new crisis every month now. What's going to happen in 45? I think that's the big question right now everybody's asking is, do we see maybe the month of October as our correction month? And then we have to kind of go into a realization that we're back to where we started. Love to get you guys' feedback on that. What do you think is going to happen here in the month of October? Drop some comments down below. Make sure and smash the like button because it does help us get into the algorithms and help other people kind of uh, explore what's happening in the market. Let's listen to what Mr. Uh, Chuck Schumer had to say about this. Let's play this clip for you guys. It's been a day full of twists and turns but the American people can breathe a sigh of relief. There will be no government shutdown. Democrats have said from the start that the only solution for avoiding a shutdown is bipartisanship. And we're glad that Speaker McCarthy has finally heeded our message. In the end, more Democrats supported this bill in the House than Republicans, proving bipartisanship was the best answer all along. I want to. I want to thank my colleagues here in the Senate, especially our appropriators, yourself, Madam President, Susan Collins, and Leader McConnell. Our bipartisan work in the Senate set the tone for the bill we're about to pass. Our bipartisanship made this possible and showed the House that they had to act. All right, so you saw a couple of things here with uh, Schumer, and that is the whole scenario around the bipartisan approach. A lot of Dems uh, had to come into play on this. Obviously, the Republicans were the ones that were seemingly holding a lot of this back. Now you even have Gates really pushing hard against McCarthy, trying to dispose him as the speaker. There's a lot happening there, and it's going to continue to push forward into next month when all of this has to go right back to the drawing board and redo this. So this could get a little up and down. And especially, I'm, con I'm concerned with November because of the scenarios that we will see in both the jobs numbers, the Q4 will start to play out in the sense that we'll start to see what's happening in the markets itself. And it could be a very bad timing for this to occur again. So hopefully this all gets corrected and playing into it. Let's listen to what Squawk Box had to say about this and the impact it might have on the markets. Listen in. Joining us now is Jared Bernstein. He is the chair of the President's Council of Economic Advisors. And, and Jared, let's talk about this. We have a deal that nobody really expected we'd see. So we made it through this weekend. But what happens in the next 45 days? Well, first of all, uh, good to see you, Becky. Uh, this is good news for the American people in the sense that an unnecessary crisis that would have inflicted uh, pretty deep and wholly unnecessary pain on millions of Americans has been averted. Uh, that's good news for over one, one million active duty troops, for over seven million women and kids who risk lacking nutritional support, for travelers because of the reauthorization in this bill of the FAA and disaster relief that was also in this continuing resolution. But it did not have to happen. I think what you just played from the president is, of course, exactly right. 
he shook hands, he had a deal. In fact, there was a law passed uh, with McCarthy back in, uh, in June, in early June, uh, at the end of the debt ceiling uh, debate uh, that was designed specifically to avoid this. Senate. All right, so, you know, they kind of take doing their victory lap, uh, even though I think it's a little bit premature, but the point is, is that there was a huge economic disaster that was averted. So I think that's the positive news. Obviously, the markets responded in such ways that have helped adjust for that as well. But that's not necessarily all of it. We've also seen some other implications coming across from external uh, resources out there in the markets that have caused a little bit of this movement. I think the question everybody's asking now is, is Bitcoin going to continue higher? Or are we going to start to see Ethereum start to adjust now? Do we see some of the projects like Solana, Avalanche, et cetera, start to really fly? We'll break into all of those. So don't miss those. We'll look at some charts for you guys as well. I want to go over to a couple of stories here. Why Bitcoin price is up today. A couple of points that were hit on here. U.S. shut down a version, obviously, and also the ETF launches. Now, that is the opportunity because remember, Ethereum ETF launches today. And the other idea around this is that when you look at not only the Bitcoin opportunity for ETFs, by the way, if you're not following our, our market sentiment indicator, uh, you guys should because we are tracking both the Bitcoin and the ETH ETF, the spot ETF sentiment as a whole. It's interesting to see that sentiment kind of go up and down. But the point that they're hitting on in this article is that October is historically one of Bitcoin's best months and is often called October, name of today's video. Bitcoin's price has risen by an average of about 20% in October overall. You can kind of see the rundown right there. That green line right there, as you can kind of see where I'm waving my cursor, almost all green over the years going all the way back to 2013. So not bad. Nearly 43 million worth of shorts were liquidated. That's another scenario that plays into that. And of course, I think when you look at the general uh, move with what Bitcoin had to do, I think this is going to be an interesting week ahead of us. Now, there's a lot more that could be happening this week that could still maintain Bitcoin around the 27 to 28K range. That will be a very, very interesting thing to watch because if Bitcoin starts to edge toward around 28.6, this is where it's going to get interesting for the future. All right, a couple other things I want to hit on. Uh, right here is Ben Cowan talking about lucky number seven, first green September for Bitcoin in seven years. That's a good sign. But is it a short-lived sign? That's, I think, is really the, uh, the scenario that plays into this. Sellers have lost momentum. Buyers are now in charge. Target is near the top of the range right now. If it breaks this range that we've been talking about, which and I'll show you the chart here in a second, that Bitcoin has been moving to, if you look at just here on the daily, right there is that little high right there around 28.573 and a little bit. Of, and then, of course, the red candle starting to point, uh, point its way down on the hourly. Uh, on Bitcoin's move over the last uh, 24. So interesting moves for sure. How are you guys playing this? Is this a zone? Because this has been up and down on the sentiment charts for us. We still see sentiment somewhat waffling with Bitcoin, not necessarily as much with Ethereum, but definitely with Bitcoin. Uh, but the real question is, can we hold around this 28K mark, which is where we're hovering right about now? All right, other things. China's central bank continues to stimulate, stimulate, so reverse repo injections now at levels not seen since 2020. This is another factor that plays into us. China is starting to, you know, inject liquidity. This, of course, causes movements in the markets. It also causes some ripples in the markets as well, because I think China is going to be one that we have to continue to be cautious about in the sense of awareness of what's happening in China, both from a real estate standpoint, but also just from their GDP and their economic growth. Those are the other things that play into this. A couple of reports from chain analysis that are kind of interesting here. I thought this would be larger, and it's not. But right now, Eastern Asia, fifth most active crypto market, accounting for 8.8% of global crypto activity. And this is July 22 through June 23. So it kind of gives you a little bit of insight to that. Point is, is that you do have a significant amount of the market that is in control. Remember, the United States still has a large percentage of what is happening around the world in crypto markets, ironically, without legislation. Can you imagine what is going to happen with legislation and institutional adoption really kind of playing forward? That's where it's going to get super. I think that's when we're going to start to see some big market moves uh, overall. Here, of course, was a breakdown on the liquidity of the U.S. dollar continuing to decrease just as liquidity of stable coins in the markets. Only China continues to inject liquidity in the markets. 
And right now you've got Bitcoin pump is probably not going to last. This is one on an analyst that is looking at this. I'm kind of in this camp right now in the short term because I'm still thinking that the macro is too uh, dominant. It's too in our face uh, in the sense of what we've seen with uh, not only higher for longer, but higher interest rates holding, but also the amount of inflation and the stickiness. And it's all going to boil down to, I think that a lot of people are looking at this, and that is oil. If oil prices do get to that 150 target that some analysts are looking at, that would be devastating for the Biden administration. And it's going to be devastating for the economy because that is one of the major influxes in how inflation is really not only tracked, but received on the American population. So it's a big one to stay um, abreast of. Now, let's look at some other tokens real quick. Chainlink, of course, everybody's been asking me about this one because it has been on the move for quite some time. Just to give you an example of where this one has been, let's go up here and we'll get to its top right there. 40% right there since the 12th of September. And if you've been following us on our mastermind group, we do trade signals in there. We exited this trade at around 750, 770 uh, on getting out of uh, Chainlink, looking at maybe that eventually this thing was going to top out. But topping out, it did, but it was over $8 when it did. So that was a nice, uh, a nice room. Remember, you're not always going to hit the top. But the key is, is you don't want to be on that falling knife side. So that's something to be watching for right now. However, I think Chainlink is going to stabilize here maybe uh, around the 740 to around $7 range, which is the one I'm looking at right now. Whether or not I go back in on that will be a question mark for sure. I want to jump over to a video that was uh, done by the Bankless team. And they kind of break it down on what Wells Fargo is trying to, it was kind of just the theory of it, but listen into what they had to say. But I have some money in my Wells Fargo account right now. So I have that $1,000 and over on some Ethereum layer two, there is this uh, DeFi yield product that can provide 8% yield. If Wells Fargo sets it up correctly, there could be a button inside of my Wells Fargo user interface such that I can click it and say deposit funds into XYZ compound money market. The, the, the Wells Fargo uh, SWIFT platform connects through CCIP and out the other side, my funds are actually deposited into some Wells Fargo tokenized stablecoin money market account that is now yielding 7%. And again, the banks don't need to know how to interact. They don't need to learn how to interact with every single chain out there. You guys take care of the interoperability. That kind of thing is what's possible with CCIP. Yes, you're, 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 you're absolutely on the right track there. Um, whether it's Wells Fargo or a brokerage account, I don't know if Wells Fargo would share the 7% with you. I think they keep <laughs> as much as they could and they use. So obviously they're talking to Chainlink there, but the point being uh, that Ryan was trying to hit is that the integration of banks into DeFi could get huge quickly. The question will be whether or not they do it, because this is still old school banking systems, old school infrastructure that plays into this. Now, it doesn't mean that someone's not going to break rank and do it, because I think that's where the upside is for what this market might represent in terms of growth. So I'm still very optimistic around that, and what, that we could see that in traditional banking. However, at the same time, you've got this happening, and that is eight CEOs of the U.S. banks, including J.P. Morgan Chase, Bank of America, Citigroup, Goldman Sachs, Bank of New York Mellon, Morgan Stanley, State Street, and Wells Fargo, all facing questioning at the Senate Banking Committee hearing in December. I don't know what this is going to be about, but the point will be, I think, of how this is going to maybe play into how DeFi could be looked at in the future and whether or not banks are going to actually step into this zone. If we see that kind of innovation happening in the banking industry, obviously I think all of you guys would agree that's going to be pretty big. Now there are the staunch uh, you know, proponents that are very anti-bank and I completely understand that, but I think this is going to be good for the people that maybe are not in the crypto market or even De DeFi as of yet. It's going to open this up to a lot more people, which is what we need for that bell curve to really take place. Other things that are happening right here, of course, Ethereum's one of their biggest rivals who we're talking about here is Solana, gearing up to outperform ETH, according to ARK Invest crypto analyst. A couple of things. This was Berniski, who is the co-founder of Venture Capital Forum Placeholder, says that investors should take a different stance on Sol overall. 
And if you look at the charts, I mean, Solana, we'll take a look at here in a second. But if you're a builder, uh, I understand that you desire to stick with ETH and to continue. Ethereum's future is bright, but I think a lot of people look at this just in the core functionality of what Solana has been able to do. And I always say this, is you have to prove it. And of course, Solana is under a test right now with Visa that could prove it, that they could be able to handle scalability at the highest level. So if you're an investor not adding some soul exposure, existing ETH requires lots of mental gymnastics. Uh, and also Ethereum enthusiasts may also be caught off guard when Solana takes a large portion of, the, of uh, value capture. That is a real question because when we start to pull out of this market, and when I say this market being the bear market, there's gonna be a couple of winners and you're gonna have a handful of projects. Solana has breakpoint coming up here end of month. There's gonna be a lot of things to watch for. And I, and I think if you're following Solana at all, follow that event because it's gonna open up your eyes to what really is going on over there. But at the same time, I think it's gonna open up the eyes in the, the Ethereum camp as well in terms of development and some of the layer twos that are working on projects within the ETH ecosystem. So it could get very interesting uh, over the next few months. A uh, few months out there. Let's take a look at the Solana chart just to give you an idea, idea here. It's kind of moving up quickly here on the daily. Uh, not a bad little move here, but when you look out over time, this hasn't really exploded. Obviously, it's kind of range bound right now. If you look back here at the high that we had back in February, which was around $26 versus that high we had right there in July, which was hovering around the 28, spiking up almost 30. Uh, but again, are you entering Solana? This is one of the tokens that I hold I like, and it's one of the tokens that I will continue to invest in, mainly because I'm looking at hedging my ETH positions. And also the reason I think the technology, which I believe in, but I still have to, it has to be proven that it can actually handle the kind of scale that we're gonna need for this next level of adoption. So definitely a lot of stuff happening. Sure, other ones to watch, of course, is Avalanche. Avalanche's subnet also getting a lot of activity. When this goes to the main net, this is gonna get very active very quickly. This is another one that I'm very interested in how it could take place. And the keys here with Avalanche, and we've had them on the show many times with John Wu. I'll play a clip for you John, on John Wu in a second. Is this transition that they're making. And they've been able to do, they walk the walk. They said they were gonna do certain things. They executed on it. They were able to do it. Let me go to a clip real quick here with John Wu. Listen to what he had to say about adoption and where it's coming from. I don't know if people are, uh, realize this, but in 2022, presumably a bad year for the asset class, most people say there was about 11 trillion stable coin dollars settled on chain. That is 10 times bigger than PayPal does a year and almost the same volume as Visa on an annualized basis. So when people say, why is PayPal, why is Visa, why are all these institutions trying to create stable coins, that is why. For Avalaz, we've been working with other types of institutions, non-traditional finance type institutions, tokenizing assets all around the world. There is a real product market fit there, and that is institutional adoption. All right, so Wu hits it right there on the head. However, I want you to come to reality with Avalanche, and that is if you look at the chart, from the time that Avalanche peaked, which was right back here in November of 2021, the high of uh, Bitcoin and also the metaverse, because we saw a lot of activity in that period, we are down 93% on Avalanche. So definitely if you look at this, many people would say, okay, well, Paul, that's, that's an opportunity right there to start to move in on Avalanche. I'm gonna zoom in on this one a little bit to give you guys a little bit of a look. But even still, right now in the near, short, near term, to even the short term, Last low we saw was hovering around that $10 range, and it had kind of been holding that, but it has obviously pulled down under that. And that's a question. Would you consider going into Avalanche? That's the one. Is October a good enough time for you to take a look at Avalanche on a long-term hold? Love to see what you guys are talking about uh, there. All right, here was Peter Schiff talking about the bond market. He's talking here. We're still early in the biggest bond market crash in U.S. history. A couple points he hit on. He suggests that in the every industry from governments, corps, landlords, families, all have been dependent on low-cost debt for their financial stability. All that are facing severe consequences. These entities now are at risk of financial ruin. And he argues that if Federal Reserve uh, steps in and tries to save these struggling entities, it could inadvertently kill them by causing inflation to just get crazy. So 
This is a very uh, balanced tight wear that uh, tightrope that uh, Powell is walking right now. And I think when you look at the impact that many uh, entities that he's talking about do and will uh, adjust to, this I think he's right on. If we do see this kind of scenario play out, Powell is going to have to respond in some way. And that is going to cause market shredding to a certain extent in terms of more rates. So it is a, it is a tough time right now to look towards the next few months. Uh, SBF is getting ready to launch jury selection in Sam Bankman's uh, trial. So we're going to see that, of course, on the U.S. Uh, versus SBF. And then wrapping up here, just to give you an example of what's happening out there in the utility space, and the reason I put this chart up is just to show you the amount of impact that these kinds of scenarios, these market pressures are having on what has mostly been fairly commonly stable uh, stocks, especially in the utility space. Right now, everything in the red uh, around all this. Love to get, get you guys' comments. Make sure and drop some down below. If you're not in our Diamond Circle, make sure and get in on that. It's the best place to get additional content. If you guys want to catch me out there on Twitter, it's at Paul Barron. We'll catch you next time right here on TechBath.